about how it breaks it down into different shapes, into different segments. We're going to go into the database and explain uh, why these segments are needed and how it chooses different operations and why it chooses different operations. All the aspects that we can in this webinar, we're going to do it and try to explain it to our fullest that we can, actually. So let's actually get started. And let's just give a quick, brief overview of exactly what AHRM is. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. AHRM is basically taking your solid model and when you open up AHRM, you're recognizing all of the holes that are on the part. No matter what direction they're in, you're recognizing all the holes, and these holes are turned into hole features. Okay, we'll explain it as we go along in the webinar itself. When they're recognized after that point, they're then converged into machinable features, so what, how they can be, what different types of uh, shapes and uh, uh, elements exactly, or segments I should say, exactly how they're broken up into what they call machinable segments. After all this is done, it's distributed into feature sets. Now, uh, feature sets, what exactly is feature sets? Well, actually, let me go further down over here. When you open up the program, as I said, you have the whole feature page, as shown over here. Okay? Then, the next page, where it breaks it up into different machinable feature pages, uh, and, and to a different additional, um, sorry, where it breaks it up into different <coughs> segments, machinable segments, and again, I'll get into that in a few moments. After that is done, it breaks it up into feature sets. What exactly is feature sets? Well, you have holes coming onto a part in different directions. So each feature set is basically taking all of the holes from all the dif different areas and breaking it up into its proper MAC position. Those, each feature set is a different MAC position. Then it chooses the technology and then creates the operations. Okay, so let's actually start with step one, actually recognizing the holes itself. And for that, I'm going to go over to my other screen. And, okay, now before we even start, there are two rules that should be, you should uh, take into account when starting uh, HRM. Rule number one is for each direction that you're working on the part, you have to have the proper MAC position already identified. If, for example, you're working on, in this particular case, a three-axis machine, you'll note that this part has holes on the sides as well. So when working on a three-axis machine, this cannot be done in the same MAC position. So you have to have MAC positions for this side over here, for this side over here, and for that side over there as well, besides the one on top. Now, the second rule that also has to be taken into account is that your target must be defined. You have to have your target defined. Without your target, has no idea what you want to do hole recognition on. When you have your target, okay, this is what I'm doing my hole recognition on, fine. Okay, so let's go back to rule number one, the MAC positions. Like I said, this part, I need to have a MAC positions for all sides because this is being done on a three-axis machine. So if I go into Coordinate System Manager, at this point, we only have one MAC position. So I'm going to add my other MAC positions that I need over here. And let's start by adding 
MAC coordinate system 2 to this side over here. And I'll accept that. So I now have another MAC position as shown over here. Let's add another one. Okay, this is going to be MAC uh, coordinate system number 3. And I'm going to put this on this side over here. And I'll accept that. And now I need just one more, so I'll do that as well. I'll add one more to this side over there. And now we have our four MAC positions as shown over here. Okay? So we have, as I said, going back into here, four, three, two, and one. So let's start now with the automatic hole recognition and machining. Okay, now we're actually ready. We have all our home positions and we have our target. Right click on operations and we'll go into the option of hole recognition plus technology. And since I've already done this on this particular part already in the past, I'm going to go directly to my part HR database because Remember, when you create it for the first time, it automatically creates one for the part as well. Okay? Since I already have one for the part, I've done this already, so I'm just going to go directly into the part HR database. <coughs> At this point, it's being recognized. When it's being recognized, it's basically, it's finding all of the different holes all of recognizing all of the different shapes and groups. Now, what do I mean by shapes and groups? Okay? You see we have here a shape, and in each shape we have different groups. Let's actually take a more visual look of what this actually is. Now, just for a little time out for a moment, remember I mentioned we have here, this is our uh, whole uh, AHRM uh, manager as it goes step one to the end. We also have besides that on the very top our toolbar. Let me just take it out here for a moment. A Salkim whole recognition toolbar. I'll put it back up here. In this one we can see our technology database which we'll get back to in a few moments. And also another important feature is you can also see pictures, and get your data. What do I mean by pictures and data? Well, let's do the following. If I were to click on shape one, it shows me the shape of what it actually, what's actually in shape one over here. Okay? I hope we'll talk about the actual shapes itself, exactly what it's finding there, but you note your data is empty because even though you may have a hole, holes come in different sizes. So therefore it breaks it up into groups. If I take a look over here, we have group one. In this particular case we have one group. It shows the, sh the picture stays the same, but now it gives me more information in my data. It gives you the information about the whole parameters, about its depth, and that it's one cylinder. Okay, you have one cylinder, gives you all the information about the diameter, the height of the, uh, of the cylinder, all of this information is over here. It also sees that it, it's, it's a thread. All of this information is here. If I were to go to shape two, it's a different type of hole. Also with its particular shape as well, as shown over here torus, cylinder. If I go now to shape 3, for example, you see that there is a drill. Now, what do I mean by drill? If I were to go into the group itself, it shows the actual cylinder. You can see that as well over here. And the drill also has a cone shape at the bottom. All of this is automatically recognized. Okay? But you see all the information over here. Shape 4, for example, 
It's a countersunk call. If I go into group one, you'll see this particular feature over here. We have here the chamfer. It shows you the chamfer over here. <clears throat> and by the way, you can see that over here as well. You can see the, ch the, the actual group and the chamfer. When I click on chamfer, you see the chamfer itself is highlighted. If I click on the cylinder, you see the cylinder is highlighted. So everything is visible at any point. You see that here, you see it in this picture here as well. All the information, group two, a different size chamfer, and a different cylinder. Okay, all of this is over here as well. And even this one over here, we have our counter borehole. At the very top of the part, you can see we have a counter borehole over here. We'll zoom in a little bit over here. Group one, you can see exactly what it's choosing over here. Now you'll see that this has a, it picked up and it has a chamfer on the very top. You can see that over there. It picked up that there's a cylinder, the top cylinder, the large cylinder as shown over here. Another cylinder which is the actual hole, the smaller hole over here, as well as the cone. So in other words, right now, this recognized all of these shapes. Okay, now that I've recognized all of the shapes, that's not enough. It has to actually now decide what kind of, how is it going to break it up into different machinable areas? Okay, what it does is it breaks up now into different segments. Well, how is this done? Let's go to our next step, our M features. This is what we call machinable features or segments. Now, note, the moment I did this, let's go back to shape one. Okay? If we go to shape one, you'll see the following. Let's take a look at the bottom. It shows that this particular shape is made up of a drill and a thread. Okay, if I were to go into group one of shape one, you'll see the drill, all the parameters of the drill, and all the information about the thread. Group two as well, group three, and so on and so forth. All of this is automatically recognized over here. All the information is broken, and it's broken up into different, uh, as I said, different segments. And we'll take a closer look at that as well in a moment, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, same thing with shape two. You can see the same thing. This is a hole. You can see it's a drill and a flat cylinder. In this particular case, you have a flat cylinder at the very top of the hole over there, okay? Small as it is, it's still there and it recognizes that as well. Shape three, group one of shape three, we see that it's made up of a drill. You can see the drill, including the cone shape at the bottom, and the chamfer. All the information is over here. You can see everything broken up. We can go down the line. Group four, for example, is made up of a drill, chamfer, and a thread. You can see how it's broken up. And shape five, in this particular case, we have the uh, counterbore, so we have the drill. Flat cylinder. What's a flat cylinder? It's a cylinder that has actually a flat bottom as shown over here, as in the counterbore. And it also picked up that it had a chamfer on top. Now, where are all these uh, shapes, where are all these segments used? Okay? Well, let's actually open up, let's close up the picture for a moment. We'll close this for now. And let's actually go into our database for a moment. If I go into my technology database, let's take a look at the left-hand side. Remember, I talked about that it broke it up into different segments. Drill, flat cylinder, chamfer, for example. Well, let's take a look over here. You can see in our technology database, we also have the same thing. It's broken. We have different types of operations for drilling, different types of operations for flat cylinder, 
different types of operations for chamfer, flat chamfer, if there's a chamfer that has a flat bottom, for threading, all of these, once they're recognized, they'll know, okay, I have different types of operations that they can be used. These are all the different operations that can be used in, when it recognizes those shapes over there. Now note, with each one of these, for instance, like drill, it has a whole set of different types of operations. Well, what does it choose when? That we'll see in a few moments. But let's just suffice to know that all of these are recognized over here, and then we also have that in our technology database. Let me close this, and we'll get back to that in a few moments. Now, you'll note also that we have our shapes, okay? We have our shapes over here as well, you'll note that they come on all different sizes. This side over here, this side over here, in other words, everything is recognized. We come with these over here, you, you'll see we have, this is over here as well. Okay, once all of this is recognized, the next step is actually breaking them into what we call our feature steps. Okay? If I go into our next step over here, feature sets, you'll note that it is broken up into four different feature sets. We have our first one over here, which, by the way, if you noticed, our first one is in bold. Bold meaning that is the one that is active right now, and I'll explain active in a moment. But you can see every single time I click on a feature set, this is showing that it's working on this side over here. This feature set shows that it's working on this side over here. In other words, every Mac position has its own feature set. Okay? That's exactly what the feature set does. Now, once it's done, we can go now to the next step. The next step is actually choosing the types of technology that needs to be done on the feature set itself. And it does it for the current feature set. So at this point, the current feature set is feature set one. So if I go to the next step, technology, what's actually being done now, it's recognizing the different technologies needed for the different areas, for the first feature set. For example, if I go into Tech 1, you'll see that it's doing for Group 1 the following. It's doing a peck drilling and tapping. Okay, so let's stop right now at this point. And I'm going to ask a simple question. Why is it doing peck drilling? Okay, it saw that I had a uh, drilling operation, I saw that I had a drilling shape over there, and I had a tapping, tapping is understood, but why peck drilling? What made it decide to use a peck drilling instead of a regular drill operation? Why specifically peck drilling? Who told it to do that? For that, to understand where that came from, what we're going to do is open up our technology database. And as I said, our first operation is drilling, and as I mentioned, it's picking the peck drilling, which we see over here, which is our second step here. It's not our first step, it's our second step. Now, the way this works is as follows. When it sees that it has to do work on a drill segment, what it does is as follows. It starts by going down to the first option called drilling. Now, in order, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to do drilling, to use this option, okay, it has to meet these conditions. These are the requirements for the drilling operation. Now, before I actually explain this, if I right-click on drilling, go into edit, you'll see that the drilling operation includes a pre-drill spot. These are the actual operations that are be going to be done and a regular drill operation. Okay, 
Now, let's see now how the, what has to be met. What are conditions that have to be met in order for it to do the drilling? Well, the first thing it's asking me is, is telling me like this. It has to have the HR segment diameter, in other words, the diameter of that segment. Let's actually take a, cup, a quick look at what we're doing over here. We're talking about these tap holes over here. And let me to take some information so we'll know, know a little more information about this. First, the diameter over here is 4 millimeters. In other words, the segment diameter is 4 millimeters. Okay. Now, I'm going to also check on the bottom diameter over here, and we can check that the distance, in other words, the actual depth is 12 millimeters. Those are two bits of information that I need for this moment. Okay, so now let's go back to our conditions. If our HR, sorry, if our HR segment diameter, which is 4 millimeters, okay, is less than or equal to our maximum tool diameter. What's our maximum tool diameter? Let's see. Over here we have it as a value is 10. So in other words, if 4 is less than and equal to 10, in other words, the first condition is met. Okay, so, so far so good. But now it's telling me I have to also meet the second condition. What's my second condition? My second condition is saying, okay, may H Sorry, uh, let me go back again. I missed something up. The first condition was the HR segment diameter is less than or equal to the maximum tool diameter. Maximum tool diameter, I said that. Okay, the maximum tool diameter, 25. My mistake. So, so far, we're still okay. 4 is less than 25, no problem. The second condition that must be met is that my HR segment diameter four millimeters must be less than or equal to the maximum single drill diameter. My single drill diameter is 10 millimeters. This is four, so no problem. I want to do this with one tool. So, so far the second condition is met. Now let's take a look at the third condition. The third condition is telling me the following. That the height to diameter ratio must be less than or equal to the maximum drill height ratio. What exactly is this? Well, let's take a look down here. Height to dimension ratio. Height to dimension ratio, as shown over here, is as follows. If I take my HR segment height, which is HR segment height, we measure that at 12 millimeters. Divide that by my HR segment diameter, my 4, 12 divided by 4, that's 3. In other words, my HR diameter ratio, this value is 3. Now, if 3 is less than whatever my maximum drill height ratio is, then it'll do this. What's my maximum drill height ratio? Let's go down here. 6. Okay. So now, we have a little bit of a problem. Because our maximum, the height the ratio, okay, is less than, is actually more than it, okay? So, therefore, it will not do the drilling. When it doesn't do the drilling, okay, it says, okay, let's go to the next step. This is no good. All right, next step, pet drilling. Now, the beginning is the same. HR segment diameter, maximum tool, hole, tool diameter, that's fine so far. The HR segment diameter is less than or equal to the maximum single drill diameter. This is 4. This is 10 as shown over here. So far, we're so good. Now let's go to the next step. The height to diameter ratio is more than, okay, the maximum drill height ratio. And the height to diameter ratio is less than or equal to maximum pectoral height ratio. Let's see my pectoral height ratio. Maximum pectoral height ratio is 6. We're fine. Everything is in line. So in other words, 
Therefore, it's using the PEC drilling. This is why we have PEC drilling shows over here. So this, through the set of conditions, it decides what operations are going to be done for the drill segment. If I were to right click on drill, PEC drilling and look in here, over here, you see we have two operations over here. One is a pre-drill spot and the PEC drill operation. So therefore, that is how it decides what is being done for that drilling se sector. Note, it also doing tapping. Let's go back into here for a moment. And tapping is very simple. If it's less than a maximum tool thread diameter, use the tap. And as you can see, maximum tool thread diameter uh, is 16. No problem. It'll do it. Okay, so everything fits in line, so it'll do a tapping as well. What's inside the tapping? A tapping operation. That's it. Okay. So now that it knows all this information, let's take a look at group one. In group one, you can see, here's the PEC drilling, and it shows you exactly what it's going to be doing with the PEC drilling, these two operations, like I showed you before, inside the operations of the PEC drilling. Okay? And the second part, which was the tapping, you can see that it chose exactly one operation for the tapping itself. And this is done true for every single one of these areas. In this particular case, it breaks it up into three di different groups, the PEC drilling, flat drilling, chamfer drilling. Let's take a look for a moment at the tool database, at the technology database for our flat drilling. You can s for our fl flat drilling is right over here, our flat cylinder. It chose the option of flat drilling because it met these type these um, um, conditions over here. Had the pocket been larger, it would have gone into a pocket milling instead of a, of a flat drilling. So in this particular case, th this can be done with a flat drill, which has 180 degrees at the bottom. Okay. Otherwise, it would use a pocket operation to clean out that counter bore hole. Okay. So that's how everything is decided over here. Once this is done, all I have to do now is go to my next step, which is generate operations. And the operations are now been, have now been generated. Now, this was done for the first feature set. But I need to do this for the other feature sets as well. So we'll go back to where the feature sets are. And now what we're going to do is I'm going to right click on feature set 2 and set that as my current feature set. Then I'll do the same operations. Click on technology, generate operations, that's done. Same thing for the next one, feature set 3, set as current, click, click, and that's done. Feature set 4, that is now current, click, click, and that's done as well. So now that they're all done, let's take a look inside our, at our operations. You'll note all of the operations were done, a total of 24 different operations. And now you'll also note that these operations are actually regular operations, just like you're creating any other type of operation, in your normal uh, drilling operations. If I were to right click on them or, and click on edit, you can edit them as well. Everything is open. Nothing is closed. Everything that is done can always be edited. You still have the freedom to make any kind of changes you want without any problem. Let's also note one more thing. Let's take a look at the tool table itself. <clears throat> if I were to open up the tool table, you'll note that we have all of our tools we created over here. Now you'll note there are also a total of two different spot drills, okay? Spot drill of 6 millimeters and a spot drill of 12 millimeters. You'll also note 
if I go down over here, that spot drill is used in uh, several different operations. We have a spot drill here, over here, another spot drill uh, as we go further down uh, the line over here. Okay, spot drill there, spot drill there. We have several different operations that are using spot drill. But what the system does is also as follows. It's smart enough to know that if there's um, a drill already, if there's a tool already in existence, don't create another tool. Use that tool that's already there. So it didn't create a tool as well for every single one of those operations. If the, op if the previous one was already created, it will not create a new tool. If one exists inside my tool table, another one will not be created as long as it meets the exact same requirements. Okay, what I'd like to do now is I've shown this on the part right now where I specifically had to create all the different MAC positions. Let me open up one more part. Now, <clears throat> part is opening up, it's a little heavy, no problem. Okay, taking a look at this part, in this particular case, I am working on a five-axis machine. In other words, I have one MAC position, it's on MAC 1, okay? Now, since I'm going to be doing indexial operations over here, we're talking about drilling on all different sides, what's going to happen over here, what I need to happen is that, okay, I have one MAC, but I do need different home positions as well, okay? One MAC is fine because the MAC, in this particular case, can handle all of these different positions. Okay, but I still need, however, a position for every single side over here. For, oh, for that side, that side, on that side, this one over here on top. I need positions for every single one of them. If I go into my coordinate system manager, you'll note at this point I only have one position. Okay? But note again, all of them, all of the sides can still be, however, done in MAC1. Different positions, that's true. I will need all the positions over here, but it will all be in MAC1. So let's see now what happens when I use my automatic hole recognition machine. Again, right click, hole recognition and technologies. Again, since I've run it on this part already in the past, I have my part whole recognition database, and I'll use that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, everything is being loaded up. Again, we have the first stage where everything is recognized. Okay, all of the shapes, all of the groups are recognized. Again, we go to our M features. Again, everything is done over here. Same thing with our feature sets. Note, there's only one feature set. That's all there is, just one feature set. Okay? If I go to a next step where I create my technology, again, it creates the technology for all of whatever is inside that particular feature set and then create the operation, okay? Now, at this point, like I said, it's creating all the operations for that entire feature set, and in this case, I only have one feature set. You saw I only had one MAC and only one MAC position. But let's take, go out of here now, and let's take a look what actually happened. When I have one MAC position, and everything can be done in that one MAC, although I do need different positions, what the automatic hole recognition and machining will do is 
it will automatically create the different positions needed in that Mac. In other words, I only had here before, as you saw, only Mac 1 position 1. But since all of them were able to be done in the same Mac, it created the other positions automatically. I did not have to do anything. You'll also note that in a matter of a minute, I did a total of 170 operations. Okay? Um, again, these operations are totally editable. Okay? You can go into every single one of them and edit them. Now, I've been asked questions in the past about uh, repositioning. If I want to move, uh, um, if I want to move a specific operation from one to another, okay. For instance, I want to take this spot drill and put it together with that one over there. You can move them; not a problem moving them, as long as you don't break the order of that particular group. Note that this is a group, HR040. You can see that this group has a name, okay? As long as you don't break the order of this group, you can move this up. For instance, if I want this, I can take it, and I'll drag it to this spot drill over there. No problem. You can do it, okay? But what you can't do, let me take this back to where this was before. What you can't do is you cannot break the order in the group itself. Because this is important to the way everything has to be uh, machined. Okay. 